real estate, man, real estate's got its own language, right? Real estate jargon, right? If you're going to be investing in real estate, doing deals, man, you want to talk the talk. You're going to be talking to real estate agents, commercial real estate agents, reading MLS listing descriptions, talking to property managers, all, all that stuff, right? You got to know what they're saying. There's a lot of terms that are used in this industry, and some of them have some hidden meanings. So today what I'm going to do for you all, we're going to go through 25 real estate terms and what they really mean. Welcome to the show, folks. My name is James Wise, and I will be here to assist you in your real estate educational quest, right? This show, I like to answer your questions, whether you send them to me or they're things that I think you should be asking. I like to give my take on hot topics all related to real estate, yada, 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 right? I know a little bit about the biz. been around for a while, folks. I've sold $200 million worth of real estate, and I currently manage a $75 million real estate portfolio. So, uh... I actually work in the business all day, right? Sometimes you get the gurus that their only business is guruing to you, right? You got to wonder, like, well, does this guru really do what he says I should do? Think about that, right? So in today's show, I figure there's a lot of you that are newer, right? And there's a lot of terminology in real estate, right? We got our own language in this business, right? From purely residential stuff to some commercial real estate terms to some terms with hidden meanings, right? I'm going to go over 25 of them, right? 25 fairly commonly used terms uh, that I thought would be important to discuss with you. Is it in any particular order? No. Should I maybe have put it in some type of like order that kind of leads into stuff? Possibly. I did not, though. So these are just going to be at random, right? And the first one, number one, cozy. What does cozy mean? Cozy is one of those terms with a hidden meaning. Cozy means small as fuck. Most realtors won't tell you that, but I will. Cozy is small as fuck. Uh, per my last email, this is a term uh, that you're probably going to only see if you're talking with a real estate agent, right? Uh, so they might say something like, per my last email, I had told you this. What that means is, motherfucker. I told you the answer to your question already. Stop asking me the same question. The answer is the same. So if you start seeing, per my last email, uh, from realtors you're talking to, you should know you're probably annoying the hell out of them, and you should pay attention more. All right. Fixer upper, right? You'll see this in listing descriptions. That means this house needs some work, man. This house... Needs some reno. This house looks like crap. The new buyer's going to need to put it back together. Ugly house, but that's good for us investors, right? Fixer-uppers are how we make our money. Time is of the essence. That means hurry up, motherfucker. We need to move. If you do not get up and do the offer right now, you ain't going to get the property especially in hot sellers markets. Time is always of the essence, man. I've made a ton of money in real estate by acting quickly. If you snooze, you lose, folks. Time is of the essence. Net operating income, little commercial term, right? This is going to be how much money the property's making, right? Your NOI, your net operating income. So you take your income, right, which is probably going to be your rent, and maybe you have some laundry income, uh, so to speak, right? But that's pretty much it, right? Rent, laundry income. Uh, you take that and you deduct it from uh, your expenses, right? And when I do uh, NOIs for people, net operating income, uh, what I like to do is give them both their fixed and their variable expense estimates. So like fixed stuff, right? Like you get your taxes, right? You're going to pay the same tax bill unless the property value changes. But you got your taxes. You got your insurance. Uh, again, insurance could change as your premium changes. But more or less like taxes, insurance, your PM fee, right? These are like fixed. But then you have like extremely variable stuff that you really can't predict. I mean, yes, all those can change. Uh, and like mortgage, right? Mortgage is more or less going to be the same, again, unless things change like your taxes because a lot of times your taxes are in with your mortgage or like maybe you have an adjustable rate uh, 
mortgage, that could change, or maybe your insurance premium is paid in your mortgage. But more or less, you have a generalized idea of what those things are going to cost, and they're more or less going to remain consistent until a change happens. But then there is variable expenses that are definitely going to be wild that you can't exactly predict. You're only going to predict based on uh, past experience. And those are going to be things like your repair and maintenance costs, your capital expenditure costs, uh, your vacancy expense, the amount of money you're guessing people will steal from you, right? So that is how you get your net operating income, right? That is the gross money that's supposed to come in, less all the expenses that come along with owning a rental property. A good rule of thumb is the 50% rule. Oftentimes, uh, properties under normal circumstances, if they're in a very blighted area, this is definitely going to sway it, but uh, most properties average out to an operating expense around half or 50% of the gross rents. Does it happen all the time? Absolutely not. But that's like a very good back-of-the-napkin math uh, way to quickly look at something and see if it should be investigated further. For more help on investigating rental property numbers further, how much money you're actually going to make, you want to check out my other show, the MLS Search and Analysis Show. Cap rate. It's another thing I go over on that show, right? So say we have a house that rents for X amount, and after you get all of the expenses factored in, it's got an NOI from the last one of 10 grand a year, okay? So you're making, your not operating income on that house is 10 grand a year. And let's say you bought that house for 100 grand. You take 10, divide 10,000, divided by 100 grand, and you get 10. That's your cap rate. 10, okay? NOI divided by the purchase price. Your cash on cash return, okay? That's going to be the return you make with your cash into the deal, right? Let's take the same property. It's a $100,000 property. It's got a $10,000 a year NOI, which means it's got a 10 cap, okay? You're with me? Good. But the number one reason you should be investing in real estate, folks, is the financing. You should typically, if you're buying an investment property, only put down 25%. The bank kicks in 75% over 30 years. That's amazing. That's why we're in this game. That's why this game makes more millionaires than any other business in the USA, folks. So let's take that same house. Now all you have into the deal is 25000 okay, because the bank put the other 75000 in, right? So the same $100,000 property with the same $10,000 NOI, in the same 10 cap, you've now only put 25 grand into it because you financed it, okay? So what you need to do is you need to take your NOI, your 10,000, and minus out uh, your mortgage costs of that year, which I'm going to guess is probably going to be around 4,000, right? I'm using round numbers, obviously. Now, that 4,000 off of your 10, that's going to leave you with six, right? That is your free cash flow, okay? You take the six, and you divide that by the amount of cash you have into the deal, which is only 25000 all right? That is your cash on cash return. And in this particular situation, that'd be like 20, I don't know, 22, 23, 24% somewhere in there. Next one, good bones. That means this house is ugly as all hell. It's probably got freaking wallpaper from the 70s, a little old lady house, but you know what? It was well taken care of, right? You don't have foundation issues. You don't have major structural problems. You probably got decent windows, good furnace, good hot water tank. Good bones, that's important. When you're a new investor too, the best types of flips uh, or bird deals, and we'll get into bird deals later, but the best types of those those are the ones that have good bones, and you just need to do a cosmetic rental, right? So good bones, whenever you see good bones, pay attention to that property. Some money could possibly be made, and it's going to be fairly easy. Uh, this one, triple net lease, all right? You're probably only going to see a triple net lease when you're doing commercial terms, right? I'm talking like uh, you're renting renting to like an auto mechanic or a store or something like that. That means uh, triple net, they do everything, right? We went earlier, we were talking about leases. You got your gross minus all your expenses. Well, in a triple net, you got no expenses. It's just like, boom, 
Here is the money. We take care of it all. We pay the taxes. We pay the insurance. We pay this. We pay that. Triple net. So if you have like a $1,000 a month triple net lease, that means you walk away with 12000 right? So it's not like you walk away with 6000 right? No, you get 12 triple net lease. You're not going to see too many triple net leases uh, in the residential space. As a matter of fact, you'll see none of them. Uh, but in the commercial space, you will. As is, that means this is the house, man. You're taking it as is. No questions asked. You want to get an inspection? Do it prior to. When you make an offer, we're only accepting as is offers. This is our house. You can make an offer. No contingencies, right? No inspection contingency. No appraisal contingency. None of this. This is the house. Take it or pound sand as is. Proof of funds. Often required when you're going to put in an offer, right? When you're going to put in a cash offer, right? When you put in a cash offer, the sellers want to see your proof of funds. That means money in your bank account. So you could send in a screenshot of how much money you have. I know a lot of newbies and freshies out there seem to think hard money loans are proof of funds. They are not. That is a pre-approval letter. So if somebody's like, hey, we're only accepting cash offers. You're like, great. I want to pay 100 cash. And then you hand them a pre-approval letter. They're going to think you're a complete idiot. I've gone through this with people many times. So I'm like, hey, man, you're making a $100,000 offer? Great. Send me your proof of funds. And then they send me a hard money uh, lender <laughs> pre-approval. And I'm like, this is a pre-approval for a loan. They're like, no, it's hard money, so it's cash. No, it's called a hard money loan because it's a loan. You're an idiot. Don't be that idiot, guys. Now that you've watched this video, you won't do that. And another agent on the other end of that phone or that email chain won't think you're a complete fucking moron. Congratulations. Pre-approval letter. Hey, there you go. If you do want to make a hard money loan offer, that's fine. Acknowledge that it's a financed offer and submit your pre-approval from your hard money lender. Or this is also uh, what you'll supply if you're submitting an offer with a regular conventional lender, right? That good 30-year financing I spoke about. Title search. Title search. This is very important. We actually made a video. Uh, I'll link to this below about people stealing properties and all the scams that could come along uh, with quit claim deeds, right? Quit claim deed. You probably heard that. Maybe you've seen it on Craigslist. You see a lot of wholesalers talking about quit claim deeds. That means you're selling a property without doing a title search. Don't want to do that. Title searches are going to verify there's no liens or encumbrances on the property, such as back taxes, mortgages, things of that nature, right? If you buy a $50,000 house with a quit claim deed and you didn't do a title search, it's going to be a really sad day for you once six months later you realize it's being foreclosed and taken from you because there was actually a $100,000 mortgage on it. You see what I'm saying? That's bad. Don't ever buy a property without doing a title search, okay? Short sale. Short sales are anything but short. That means that, uh, let's say the house has a mortgage of hundred grand. The seller no longer can or wants to pay that mortgage, so they want to sell it, but they could only sell it for 80 grand. So they're selling it short, 20K of the mortgage, and they got to get the mortgage uh, lender, they got to get the lender to approve it, and that is not a short process. So whenever you see short sale, do not think you're getting a deal done anytime soon. I've been involved in short sales that have taken two years. Short sales suck because the bank don't want to lose money. You know what I'm saying? Buyer's agent. It's a very simple one. In real estate transactions, sometimes there's two realtors. Sometimes there's one realtor. Uh, the person who is working for the buyer, the agent that's working for the buyer, is the buyer's agent. Okay? It's very simple. This gets confusing, though. The selling agent. A lot of people think the selling agent is the agent working for the seller. They are not. This is uh, a term that can be interchanged with the buyer's agent. The selling agent is also the agent representing the buyer because they are the one that sold the property. They found the buyer. Okay, They're the selling agent. Closing. Okay, This means the house has actually closed, right? So uh, everything has happened and title has been transferred. Closing costs. These are the costs associated with closing the property, right? This is going to be, if you're the buyer, uh, it's going to be your 
Costs that you have to pay the title company if you're the seller, same thing. Costs you have to pay the title company, but then it's also going to include uh, your property taxes, your real estate agent commission. If you're a buyer, you might have real estate agent commission. Um, and back to the seller side, it's going to include the real estate agent commission, the title costs, typically your final utility bills, and your final property taxes. Okay, Days on the market. This is the amount of time the property's been on the market. If it just hit the market, it's like one, two, three days. If it's been on the market 60 days, it's like been for sale for 60 days. That's days on the market. Cash flow. Probably, again, I didn't put these in any type of order. I should have put this one uh, up by the cap rate and the cash on cash return stuff, right? Remember when I was talking about that property that's 100000 had the 10, NOI, or the 10 cap, and it had the $10,000 NOI? And then we talked about getting the cash on cash return. I said, hey, you take your $4,000 of mortgage payments and you subtract it from your NOI of $10,000 and you now have $6,000 left over. You divide that by your $25,000 and that is uh, how you get your like 20-something percent cash on cash return. Well, that $6,000, that's your free cash flow. That's the additional cash that comes along with that property. That is your cash flow. Burr, buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. That is an acronym for a very popular real estate investment strategy. It involves buying a distressed asset, renovating it, putting a tenant in there, renting it, going back to the bank, refinancing it with the hope that the new ARV after repair value is more than the purchase price and the renovation costs. And then when you refi it out, you get more of your money back than you would if you bought it with a traditional loan in the first place. So the idea is for you to get uh, all or some of your money back so you don't have that 25% into the deal. And then you repeat the process, right? You take that money and you do it again. Contingent. That's when a property is for sale and it goes under contract. We talked about closing earlier. This is one that is still under contract. They're not accepting new offers, but it has yet to close. It could possibly fall out, uh, so it's not a done deal. Don't pomp champagne yet when you're contingent. HOA. These are those angry uh, angry ladies driving the golf carts around nice neighborhoods and cul-de-sacs telling you that you got to paint your mailbox a different color, right? Homeowners Association, right? It's like uh, when a developer will develop a new uh, neighborhood, They'll create these laws and bylaws that all the property owners uh, in said area need to adhere to. And there's typically a fee involved because there's a little bit of common area, usually like entrances where you'll see like, I don't know, wonderful woods estates. And they got like a nice little sign. That is an HOA, a homeowners association. Wholesaling, wholesaling. That's a tough one to define because I think people have a very – uh, wrong idea of what wholesaling is, right? Wholesaling is the act of buying low and selling high. What you see a lot of people in the real estate space these days pitching is uh, people getting properties under contract in uh, from a motivated seller and then pitching them to buyers lists and connecting the buyer and the seller together and then collecting a wholesale fee or a commission. That is not actually wholesaling. That is brokering real estate, folks. And what that is that is illegal in all 50 states if you do not have a license. You need to have a license. Uh, but the true definition of what wholesaling actually is, is I actually buy a house for 25000 and then I do not renovate said house, and then I sell it to some new guy for 40000 I bought it low, I sold high. It's like flipping without the repairs. And number 25, the last one. Although, before I even explain this one, I realized when I did my list I thought I had another one in there, so I'm going to give you a bonus one. I had buyer's agent, and then I had seller's agent. It threw me off. I thought I had the third one I wanted to talk about, which was listing agent, but now I'm at the end of my list, so I guess I did it, right? Buyer's agent represents the buyer. Selling agent, you'd think represents the seller, doesn't. Also represents the buyer. And then the third one, that, so your bonus here, is listing agent. That is the one that represents the seller. Now that we got that out of the way, I can give you the last one, rent back. This is very simple. That means you're buying a property from someone who owns it, right? They're selling it to you. And instead of them moving out, they will now become your tenant in a rent back situation, right? These are 25 
common terms, common phrases, common things you're going to hear, see, or uh, be in discussions with in the real estate industry. And now you know what they mean, even them ones with the hidden meanings. If you guys got any other uh, interesting real estate terminology you would like discussed or that you're confused about or some other, you know, super popular hot button terms that I have not mentioned, drop those in the notes below. Make sure you subscribe if you want to learn how to become a better real estate investor. And better yet, if you would like to partner with my team to invest in real estate, you can go ahead and book a call below and see how you could work with me one-on-one -on, -one on that MLS search and analysis show that I spoke about earlier. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.